We are continuing with the, the theme for the week of delays and using delays uh, today in Max. But before we get started on today's topic, I wanted to first touch base on next semester, OK? Uh, next semester, Computer Music 2, those of you, some of you, let's see, those of you that are digital arts majors that are using computer music as your sequence, obviously you need to plan on continuing forward with this class. I realize that's not everybody in the class, right? Uh, some of you are taking this as an extra elective digital arts class. Some of you are uh, music uh, theory and music composition students, and you're taking you're required to take this one class. Um, but uh, know that computer music two is an option for you next semester for continuing on and working more in this space. Uh, I'm going to be changing the time of the class though, so I just want to give people a heads up as you're starting to look at your schedules. Uh, and I did check as far as what classes are currently in this time slot, and it shouldn't be a kind of conflict for anybody in this room. Uh, we're going to be moving it to, to Monday, Wednesday at noon. Okay. Uh, the only conflict that came up on my radar was um, uh, ensembles, right? Concert choirs at that time. But I, I, my understanding is nobody in here is in concert choir, correct? Cool. Okay. So Monday, Wednesday at noon is when Computer Music 2 is going to be on the schedule for next semester. Uh, so be looking for that. Uh, it'll be, uh, as, as the name implies, a continuation of this course. Uh, but some of the things that I anticipate getting into are uh, is surround sound, uh, is getting into um, actually designing your, uh, I know we're using Max for Live and we're using a couple off the shelf kind of uh, effects, but I really want to do at least a, one project where you guys design your own effect that is then available for uh, for Max for Live, and that it's it's in a package that you can distribute it easily so other Mac, other live users can uh, interact with it. Um, there's also I've done some work in the past with the um, the Boys and Girls Club here in town, uh, and actually Ableton has a program where they will donate copies of Live to nonprofits that teach. Uh, uh, music and creativity to K through 12 schools. So I, that might be a project that we take on is getting uh, copies of live down there at the Boys and Girls Club and teaching them uh, basics of uh, electronic music composition, basically. Uh, I, I have a lot of ideas for what to do in the second semester. The, 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 the hard part is making sure that it's not too unfocused, right? Uh, and making sure that we focus on a few key things. Uh, but So I'm putting in a plug for that. Do you have any questions about Computer Music 2, as far as like whether you're considering it or things that you want to know, but what we'll be doing. Right, real quick, how many people are strong, considering or strongly considering taking Computer Music 2, just so I get in a sense of how many people are continuing? OK, cool. Well, so it looks like we'll have a good group then. Um, it, it really will be you guys and whoever continues on from this class, because uh, the last time I caught the taught Computer Music 1 was two years ago, and everybody in that class has graduated now, so they're not coming back to take Computer Music 2. It's going to be basically who continues on from this class, OK? Um, <clears throat> let me know if you have other questions or things you'd like to see us tackle in Computer Music 2, especially as the, as the semester wears on, OK? Um, Monday review. Monday we talked, we, we introduced this topic of delays. Uh, I know I was uh, talking and explaining and demonstrating some of the arrange, uh, arrangement uh, tools inside of Ableton Live as well, but the effect that we kind of landed on at the end was the was the filter delay object. We're going to be continuing on uh, that, uh, and this idea of delay and feedback. I know at least one person in the reading response today talked about the fact that the confusion of feedback, because um, you you may have it up until this point. Uh, been taught that feedback is a bad thing and something you should avoid, basically. And it's not that feedback is inherently bad. It's just that uh, you need to know how to control it, really, is what it comes down to. Okay, uh, We are using feedback when we have these kind of recirculating delay lines. And actually, what we saw in the Edge video at the beginning of class and hearing some of those uh, tracks that I was playing from U2 off of the Joshua Tree at the beginning of class, uh, that's that's that recirculating echo is really feedback and delay kind of working in tandem. Okay, so um, it's not that feedback is inherently bad, it's that we just we need to know how to control it. Okay, so and hopefully we'll see some examples of that uh, as we get into it with Max uh, today. But uh, does that, I don't know, uh, is everybody clear that we're, feedback is not necessarily a bad thing, it's just it needs to be controlled? Okay. Um, and did you get enough of a sense of what the delay plugin does in Ableton Live on Monday, the, the filter delay object? We're going to be building some similar effects in Max today. Okay. Um, 
Then uh, in talking about your reading responses uh, for today, one of the things that uh, came up was this confusion about the comb filter versus the flange versus the chorus. Yes, OK. Um, there's a reason why this might be confusing. It's, it's that they're, they're overlapping with each other. OK, and it really it's a comb filter that's at the heart of creating a flange effect and a chorus effect. OK, that, if you need to kind of put it in your brain that way of the, about the fact that we use a comb filter to create both flanging effects and chorusing effects, okay? Which, I don't know, were those new um, new names for effects for some of you? Chorusing, flanging? Some people saying no, some people saying yes, okay. Um, you may have heard reference to them, but you didn't know exactly what they were. Uh, I'll bring in a few more examples on Friday of, of specific chorus and flanging effects. And it's, I'd say it's, it's okay if you have trouble distinguishing between flanging and chorusing because there is some overlap there, okay? Um, but uh, what you should be able to sort out in your head is that the comb filter is what's uh, at the heart of both the flange effect and the chorus effect, okay? Um, but I'll, I'll bring in a few examples on Friday for us to listen to to hear the, some of the differences between this. But all of this relates to one, something I, I mentioned kind of in passing on Monday, and you may have heard me mention the precedence effect, which I don't believe comes up in the tutorials, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's sometimes referred to as the Haas effect, H-A-A-S, okay? But the precedence effect, okay? Uh, this is a psychoacoustic phenomenon, which is a word we've used before, right? Psychoacoustics, what's psychoacoustics? The study of perception of sound, yes. Thank you, Maggie. Okay. Um, so this is a, a phenomenon that uh, takes place between your ear and your brain, okay? Uh, your brain will lock on to the first arriving sound, okay? Uh, and if you think about this, it's really a, a, a let's see, the, the hypothesis is that this is a survival mechanism. Think about our, our earlier ancestors existing out in the wilderness, right? Okay. If sound and reflected sound is all arriving at you to your ears, right? it's most important for you to lock on to the first arriving sound because that's usually where the, the threat is coming from. And therefore, you want to lock on to the first arriving sound so you can turn your head toward the first arriving sound, identify the threat, and then turn in the other direction and run, right? Okay? To relate it to really basic survival instinct, okay? Um, so your brain has, has this adapted ability to lock on to the first arriving sound, okay? That's precedence. So precedence meaning what comes first, right? The first arriving sound, okay? Um, but when we start playing with delays, when we start playing with comb filters and flanging and chorusing effect, we're really, we're, we're, we're playing with this precedence effect, okay? Uh, and the best way to explain it is to really think about it as a kind of a continuum, okay? If we start with zero milliseconds, right, where uh, sound, two sounds are arriving simultaneously and we therefore feel like they are the same sound, right, okay? And we kind of continue uh, on a progression of increasing time, okay, on the x-axis as I've got here on my, on my slide, okay? We can kind of break it into three zones and the numbers, different sources mention these three zones being broken up in different places. Uh, but I, I prefer to think of it as 5 milliseconds and 50 milliseconds because it makes it very easy to remember that it's 5 and 50, right? Okay, so it's an easier memory device to say 5 and 50. Those are kind of the break points, if you will, okay? So less than 5 milliseconds, when the delayed sound is arriving less than 5 milliseconds, okay, you're going to hear frequency effects. You're going to hear filters. And if you remember, I was actually talking about one sample delays with the biquad filter and two sample delays with the biquad filter. Those are definitely, right, one, we can agree, one sample is certainly less than five milliseconds, yes. In fact, it's less than one millisecond. There's, at CD Quality Audio, there's 44.1 samples per millisecond, okay. Um, so even 44 samples would be less than, is, is about a millisecond, okay, to relate it to that, that uh, capability, okay? So when we're less than five milliseconds though, we're gonna hear it as some sort of altering of the frequency spectrum, filters, okay? So we're, we're really working with delays in filters. It's just that we're working with such short delays that we don't hear them as delays. We hear them as filtering effects, okay? On the other end of the spectrum, when we're greater than 50 milliseconds, that's when we start to hear echoes, this echo, echo, 
the, the kind of effect that we're hearing off of uh, the Edge's guitar, right? Okay, or the, the the thing that we think about in terms of the, the Grand Canyon, right? That the, there's the scene in the movie, right, where you shout into the at the canyon and you hear the echoes coming back at you. Okay, that's greater than 50 milliseconds. It, it has to get beyond 50 milliseconds for us to hear it as a discrete copy of the sound. Okay, in between is best described as ambiguous, okay? We don't hear it quite as frequency effects, and we don't hear it quite as an echo, it's ambiguous. And it's in this ambiguous zone where comb filtering and um, flanging and chorusing happen, okay? Where we start to hear it as those other effects, okay? Make sense? Okay, so if you can keep these three zones in your head, basically, okay? It can help you tie together uh, filters and echoes, okay? And think of it as a, think of it more as a continuum of effects rather than three discrete types of effects or four or five discrete types of effects, okay? That's the connection between these things. Um, that's the connection between the, these. This, okay, so this stuff happens in kind of the uh, the ambiguous zone, okay? Does that help? Exp Dissect a little bit of the filter. Hunter's shaking his head. No. What's still ambig? What's still uh, I, I don't know. I, unclear? I, I, in order for me to like understand these concepts, like I need to like do it. You know? Do it and hear it. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're gonna get to that. Okay. So we'll do that. Yep. And how did you come up with number five to five fifty? The five to fifty. Yeah. Like I said, the the numbers. Some people say it's like three milliseconds. Some people say it's six. I, I it's easier to remember five and fifty. Okay, that's the reason why I like to teach it as five and fifty. Okay, same thing with um, you know we talk about the, the the range of human hearing being between twenty and twenty thousand, right? But really, uh, for me, it's probably fifteen five hundred. For you, it's probably seventeen one hundred. But it's a lot easier to remember twenty to twenty thousand, right? Okay, so that's the reason I encourage you to think of it as five and 50, okay? Okay, so Hunter wants to do this. Um, I have a little bit more math, but I have a feeling, what was the kind of sense last week when I was going mathy all on you guys? Did that help or did that confuse things? Some people are saying yes, some people are saying no, so it's kind of split. Is that a fair assessment of whether it helps you or not? How about this? Could I could I do the demo first and then come back to the math? And which might bump the math to Friday and we'll do a little bit less with the Euro rack, but would you rather I do that? So you hear it and then I start to break down some of the math behind this? Sure. Okay. I'm hearing no strong dissent in the room. Okay, so what I'm gonna do then uh, I will skip the math for now, and I will go to my demo, which is, I was going to go that, through that really fast, but it, it to, uh, I'll, I'll put it this way. Yeah, I didn't start as a math major, right? Okay, I started as a music major, and I'll be honest, the first time I saw the math, I was like, what is this? Okay, but it's through repetition of the math that I started to understand how these things are unified, how delays are connected to filters, are connected to... The, the Fourier transform, that's, that's the, the math is kind of the glue that started tying all this stuff together for me. Uh, it took repetition, basically, and all I've tried to do, again, there's a reason I don't test you on this stuff in class, because I don't think you can be exposed to it once and then have, the, have it at the kind of readily access that you can be tested on it, okay? There's a, uh, it takes repetition and years of exposure to it to where you start to have these these concepts solidified in your mind. At least that's that was my experience, basically. So that, that's the reason why I don't test on it. Uh, I, 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 and I realize some of you are coming out of uh, an educational experience where if it ain't on the test, I don't care. Uh, I'm really sorry that you feel that way because learning should be its own pleasure and its own joy. I'm, I'm more of that school of thought, basically, okay? Um, sorry. Uh, but then again, not sorry. Uh, sound, my sound design question. So I told you last week I want to try to shape these demos around specific sound design questions, okay? Uh, and where we experience echo and thinking about places that we experience things that are the most comb filter-like, okay? 
Um, I thought about alleyways. What happens in an alleyway when we have really hard surfaces really close together? What happens to the sound if you clap your hands? Lots of reverberation, right? Okay, and it's funny you went to reverberation. Reverb is probably more complex than comb filters, but usually comb filters are built into artificial reverbs. Okay, so if you think about those Pro Tools plugins that you've used, the or the Logic, Pro, what is it? Logic has like the gold verb and the platinum verb and that sort of stuff. Those artificial reverbs have layers of comb filters built into them that build up these artificial reverbs, basically. Okay. But in an alleyway, it's actually a little more simpler than a than Lee Chapel. Yes, it's a it's a simpler acoustic environment. You've got these two parallel walls, and I use Lee Chapel because it's a space we all have known and love and ex have experienced on this campus. Yes, basically. But insert name of concert hall here, right? Okay. Uh, an alleyway is a much simpler environment, and that you've got these really hard surfaces about. 10 to 12 feet apart, yes, okay, sometimes even narrower, there's a, um, uh, I don't know, I can't think of any really narrow alleyways in downtown Deland that are narrower than about 10 feet, basically, but uh, some cities do have them where like a building is built right next to a building and they could be as close as like four feet from each other, and if you clap your hands in between there, you hear this kind of ringing quality that happens, okay, that's a more or less a natural comb filter effect, okay, that you're hearing there, yeah. When you're using the reverb plugins and this is diffusion, mm -hmm. what exactly is going on when you change that? Um, you're usually altering the delay time in the in the comb filters, if I'm not mistaken. I have to I have to look at that a little bit, but okay, yeah, okay. So uh, have I set up this comb filter like where you may have experienced comb filters in the world? Okay, um, so let's talk about this in terms of. Uh, this spectrum and get into max. So there's a there is a patch to get you started in max. Okay, <coughs> so uh, I'm gonna hide my slides because you guys told me you don't want any more math, which makes me kind of sad. But I understand. So I'm starting at max. This is the uh, demo patch that you're going to find. There's also two sound files that I've attached there, cluck and boom, OK? Uh, I did this just to kind of give us a little bit something different to excite the delay with, OK? These are just me vocalizing in my office. We'll use these in a minute. Uh, but before we get to those, let me uh, start off by showing you. I think this works. OK. So I've got an object here called click. Okay, um, and if you connect click to the output, turn on the patch, you're going to hear something that's not doesn't sound so exciting in itself. Everybody hear that? I'll do it one more time. It's really short. Okay, that's a click. That is literally. One second of max, or excuse me, one sample of maximum volume, and then immediately returning to zero. Okay, it's what what's called an impulse. Okay, it's extremely useful for testing filters. Okay, in fact, it often it also gets used in ter in terms of te um, uh, testing microphones sometimes too. If you if you've taken the audio recording production class, you may remember microphones being. Uh, compared based on transient response, right? How fast they react to a sudden sound, okay? This is kind of the digital filter version of that. This is this allows us to pump one little pop of sound in, okay? And test the filter. Right now, right now we're not doing anything, right? So it doesn't have any filtering going on. It doesn't have any delay on it basically. So we're hearing just the raw click, okay? Uh, now, clicking my mouse is going to get a little old, and it, it, you may have uh, noticed, I haven't, I haven't said anything explicitly, but you may have noticed that I've been trying to um, uh, introduce different ways of controlling your Max Patch, different control methods, and we'll come back to those and I'll summarize those in a later class. But for now, I want to introduce one more, and that is the key in object. Excuse me. Key? No, it's key up. Okay. So the key object, okay? I'm going to connect that to a number box. Uh, 
And if you have the key connected to a number box, what you should notice now, even if the audio is not on, when you press different, well, let's see, I'm going to get, oh, let me lock the patch so I, I quit making objects. Everybody notice that you, you get different numbers, right, out of the key object when you press keys on the keyboard, okay? These are ASCII codes. These are the ASCII codes that correspond to different keys on your keyboard, okay? We can use this information to control different processes in our max patch, okay? And in this situation, I'd like to connect the click to a key on the keyboard so I don't have to keep pressing the mouse. I would like to be able to press a key on the keyboard and have the click pop into my, uh, my filter, okay? What do you guys think we should, what, what key would you like to uh, connect on your keyboard to the click? I have a vote for C and I have a vote for spacebar. How many people think spacebar? How many people think C? I think spacebar wins. Okay, so if you, pre if you have this locked and you press the spacebar, you'll notice that the spacebar is actually ASCII code 32. Okay, now we can't connect this directly to this because then every note, every number that comes out of this thing is going to trigger our click. And if, although I guess if you want every key on the keyboard to produce a click, you can do that. But to connect it to a specific key on the keyboard, which is sort of like key mapping in li in live, correct? Where we map it to a specific key on the keyboard. Okay, we have to do a little bit more work here. We have to program this. So unlock your patch, and we need to select. 32. So select space 32. I'm going to zoom in here. Okay. I'm going to connect that to my. Uh, I'll leave the keyboard, the, the number box there. Excuse me. Oh, what happened? It wasn't quite connected there. There we go. Okay. Just so I can see the other numbers, but select 32. And then if I take the select 32 and connect it to the bang button that I've got, okay. And this is getting a little convoluted here, so let me clean this up. I'm going to do this. I'm going to shove this over here, and I'll scroll this way. Oh, all of this. Get it back on the screen. Lovely. Okay. So now I have key going into select 32. And now every time I press the space bar, it's going to trigger that. And if I lock the patch, let me get a little slower. Okay, is it on? Oh, what did I do? I'm not hearing anything. And I must have, wow, I crashed the patch. Is it? Did it crash for you guys too or no? You just got a little, there's an error at the top. Oh yeah, that's, that's just a new version. So let me do this, let me reopen my patch. It did not like me doing that. Okay, turn it on. Yeah, okay. What do you yeah. use to get that box again? Which box? The, the big, the right there, the right in the middle. This one? Yeah, the big oh, this, this was a mistake. Ignore this. Oh. Pay no attention. Okay. That's because I was typing things with the patch unlocked, okay? Okay? So now I've got... I can press this. Everybody's able to press the space bar and get a little click out? Negative. No? Yes. I got one yes, one no. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm going to. Now let's produce a delay. Let's start with one delayed copy of our click, okay? So uh, we're going to start. This, these object names should be familiar if you read through the tutorials, okay? Let's start with. Let me get a little bigger on the screen here, okay? Let's start with the delay object, and you need to make sure you use delay tilde, okay? You notice that there are two objects, one without the tilde, which will delay bangs, which is a, a common message in Max, right? Uh, one that is delay tilde for delaying a signal, okay? You want delay tilde, okay? And I don't know, what do you think we should use as an initial value? Actually, no, we need to, uh, I'm looking at the arguments here. Is the, is the number here the initial time or is it something else? It looks like it's maximum delay, okay? So we need to actually tell it how much we, 
what the maximum delay time we could possibly want is. Okay, um, let's go beyond 50. Let's go to 100 here. Okay, the reason you have to tell it the maximum is max is actually allocating memory for your delayed samples. Okay, so it needs to know how big a chunk to of memory to grab for those delayed copies of samples. Okay, that's why you have to define the maximum delay time. Okay, so zooming back out. Okay, I'm now going to uh, let's see. I'm going to connect a live dial here to control my delay time, and I'm going to take my click, pass it over here, and then I'm going to connect it down to my addition object so that they get mixed together, right? Okay. Now if I lock this patch, when I turn up this dial, this dial is now controlling the delay, right? And by default, you're not going to hear anything because nothing's coming in, right? But if I now press my space bar, okay, Turn it up. You should hear the timbre of it change. Everybody hear the timbre of your click changing? Okay. So relate that back to my slide where I was talking about the different zones. Right? We're hearing timbre effects. Timbre effects should make you think of frequency. Therefore, we're under that five millisecond boundary, okay? So even though I've got a number here that says 105, what could I maybe deduce about this 105? What do you think the unit of measurement is? Samples, okay? Why, why would milliseconds be wrong? Think about, if it's 105 milliseconds, what did I tell you about 105 milliseconds? Yeah, we should be hearing an echo, right? Not a frequency effect, okay? The fact that we're hearing Frequency effects means that we're in that five millisecond boundary, okay? This is where the knowledge is power, right? Okay, so we uh, can have a maximum of 100 samples. Let's increase this. Let's go to, so this unit of measurement is samples. I don't know, uh, one second would be then how many samples if we're at CD quality? 44,100. 44, this is where those numbers start to come in handy, right? Okay. So 44,100, and then we need to actually take our dial, and we need to, because you, you may notice that the dial only goes up to 127. That's the default, okay? So by to change this dial, you got to go over to the, you have to highlight it, and then click on the inspector. No, or not. Let's see. Oh, I have to unlock the patch, then click on the dial, then go to the inspector, okay? In the inspector for this dial, I can set all manner of things. I can change the color. I can change the font, all that sort of fun stuff. What I'm interested in, for, though, is this range slash enum. This is where you see the 0, 127, okay? Let's go ahead and change this to something ridiculously big, like, I don't know, well, let's, see, let's do 20,000, okay? You can choose whatever you like, but Keep in mind, the more range you give it, the harder it's going to be to dial in specific numbers on this dial. Okay, so if you lock the patch again, okay, so at about seven thousand, everybody hear the echo? If I lower it, we're getting into that ambiguous range. Okay, really simple, really direct. Okay, this help you kind of hear those the differences there. So you can play around with this and, and hear this. Yeah, Christian. Oh, so I unlock the patch, click on the dial, and in the inspector, which you get to by pressing this little I right here. Okay, uh, down toward you have to scroll down, and there's this item called range slash enum. Okay. Okay. So we basically just recreated what is in this cheat sheet. Uh, let's see. Um, 
thinking about this. So let's create uh, feedback with delay. We're probably going to have to skip over multi-tap delay, so you'll have to look at that later, and then go to comb filter. So let's create some delay first, OK? Uh, the delay object in itself will not permit you to create delay, OK? Uh, in fact, you'll get, uh, you'll basically, cr uh, it won't crash the patch, but Max will basically prevent you from doing this. See how, see how I can't connect that? And no matter how many times I click, it's not going to let me connect it. Okay? Um, so you can't create feedback in objects. You can try this. So I'll go through from the mix point back around. That will let you connect. But the problem is once Max internally figures out that there's a feedback happening, it should shut down. Yeah, see, I'm not getting any sound now, okay? Because it stops itself from creating a, a potentially dangerous feedback unit, okay? So, how, you might ask, will we get feedback then, Dr. Wallach? Well, I'm glad you asked. This is where the tap in and tap out objects come from, okay? So, you start with tap in, and let's go ahead and give it, I don't know, um, 2,500. Let's see. Think about that. Yeah, that should be enough. You then connect this to a tap out object, and it can have a smaller number. Let's start with five. Okay, and the dial this time goes to your tap out object. Okay, what tap out and tap in do, these are pairs of objects that communicate with each other that allow you to create feedback in your delay line, okay? Uh, you need to connect them here, but what happens is your sound that you want to delay, you actually need to connect to the tap in object, okay? It then communicates behind the scenes, writes things into the delay line, and the tap out allows you to pull that information back out at some later point, okay? Uh, just like the delay object, you need to define the maximum time. So the tap in is where you actually define the maximum length of your delay line. Unlike the delay object, these are milliseconds, not samples. Okay, that's a key difference between these two objects. Okay, so here the unit of measurement is milliseconds. With delay, the unit of measurement is samples. Okay, that's one of the reasons why it's important to pay attention to your units of measurement, not just put in random numbers, okay? Um, so then if I take the tap out and I connect it to my mix point here before the speakers, I now have um, a delay, which I should be able to manipulate. <coughs> and again, because these are am I hearing the delay? I'm not here. Uh, oh, because it's no, because it's milliseconds. It should be. Well, let me turn it off. Turn it back on. How did I get the dial? That's the range thing that I was showing him just a minute ago. Yeah, in the inspector. Dial's too high. Way too high, yeah. yeah. Oh, because 2,500 is the maximum, duh. Oh. That's why. So let's change it back then. Let's go to I, uh, let's see, unlock, highlight, I. Uh, well, it just it's ignoring the numbers because they're too high. So now I'm going to change the range to 2,500. That's my problem. Okay. Now I should be able to control this. Lock the patch. There it is. That's what it is. Okay? And you can hear. If I type this in, I'm going to type in like 40. Get in that ambiguous zone. You can kind of hear a flange. Effect. If I turn it down even more, I get into like 20. It's not quite an echo. It's 
So that's a 20 millisecond delay, OK? OK, so we've got our delay working. We're delaying one copy of the pop, right, the click, OK? Let's create some feedback, OK? Uh, go ahead and unlock your patch. And if you go to the live game, actually, let's do, yeah, let's, yeah I'll, I'll have you build it. Uh, go to this, go to live gain is the one we want, OK? Live gain, it looks like two little bars with an arrow pointing to the left. Come on. It's not going to let me do it from there. Oh, wow, I just created three of them. Great. I only need one. Okay. Live gain is actually stereo by default, and uh, we can change that. If you don't change it, it's okay. But uh, just to show you, in the inspector, all the way down at the bottom, there's this option that says channels. Uh, two, and that's what changes it to be stereo. If you change it to one, it will instead be a mono. Double click one, but it will work in a stereo configuration. We're just going to use one channel of it. Okay, so uh, I'm going to now connect the output from tap out to my slider. I'm also going to turn down my slider, so I'm I'm you have to lock the patch in order to do that because I don't want to create uh, total feedback, right? Uh, and then if I take the output, the very first outlet, I should be able to, I'm clicking and, to create these kind of turn points. And you should be able to do that. Are you, you guys able to build segmented patch cords or no? How do you do that? Okay. First you go to, it might not be enabled on your computers, option, there's a check mark here called segmented patch cords. You have to have that checked first. But once you check that box, every time you click in the patch, it creates a new turning point on your, uh, okay? That's helpful for organizing your patch. Yes. Okay. So now if you turned down the gain a little bit and you've uh, dialed in your delay, you should now be able to press your space bar and hear if the feedback delay. Okay. At 26, I'm not hearing very much. Let me lock. Okay, we're getting closer to that comb filtering effect that you find in the alleyway, right? Okay, you can also up the delay time. Okay, and start to get echoes. Okay. But perceptually, you're going to hear those echoes recirculating above 50 milliseconds. Once you get below 50 milliseconds, that's where you start to hear the, the effects that are in the, the comb filtering, flanging, phasing. That ringing quality that you get when you have really close walls. All right. Yeah. Again, it's easy for feedback to get out of control. The, the, the trick is knowing how to control the feedback, right, to create these delay effects. Okay. Um, any questions about the feedback? Okay. Um, are you guys tired of listening to clicks yet? Never. No? Yeah? <laughs> Never? <laughs> okay. Well, I was going to suggest at this point that, I, 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 again, I, I threw those two sound files at you. Uh, if, if, if you haven't downloaded the sound files, it's okay. I just want to show you something because uh, this was a cool feature that was added in Mac 7. You can simply, if you have little short sound files you want to use, you can actually just click and drag them into the patch. Let's see. Oh, I have to unlock it first. Unlock. Then click and drag the sound file into the patch and it loads a little lovely player for you so that I can now take this instead and I'm going to instead take I'm going to take this click and I'm going to turn it into a a plus object so that I can connect other things to it. And so now rather than the click I'm going to that's me just with my tongue going, OK? But you hear the that kind of pitchy quality that you get from the, the slap back of the two walls facing each other, OK? Make sense? It might sound a little more natural than the, the one sample of impulse. And somebody found the other boom file, OK? That's good. OK? Um, so that's delay with feedback. I'm skipping over feedback with filter. You'll have to look at that on your own. I'm skipping over multi-tap delay, and I'm going to go to uh, comb filter. So if I take 
let's see, I'm going to take this, I'm just going to throw it off to the side here, and I'm going to delete this, well, let's see, I want to delete this, because I still want that live dial, okay? Because the reason for looking at the comb object, if you open up the help file on comb, what I hope it will explain, eh, kind of, you can see here, there's some things that are labeled uh, feedback, feed forward, delay in milliseconds. This sounds like a delay, but it's called a filter. What's going on here, Dr. Wallach? Okay. It's because filters and delays are really at the heart of themselves in the same family. Okay. A comb filter, even though it's called a comb filter, is a really, really efficient, good way to create these feedback delays if you give it the right settings. Okay, so like your other delays, it needs a max delay time, an initial delay time, but then internally you can set the gain coefficient and the feed forward coefficient and the feedback coefficient to control these delays. Okay, um, that's the help patch. I'll leave it for you to kind of look at on your own, but right. let's, let's do this because uh, uh, I haven't shown you this process yet. So all of these uh, sub patches, right? I talked about before. If you double click on them, you can open them up and you can look at these internally, uh, the internals of it. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and take the comb filter one that I've already designed, patch it in, and if I click on this, okay, if I go up to the edit menu, one of the features of Max is this encapsulate, de-encapsulate. Okay, uh, this is a a patch that I encapsulated earlier. If I now hit de-encapsulate, it's going to expand. If I zoom out, there it is. Look, it, it moved all the components up a level, basically. Okay. So now I get a comb filter with the user interface objects that I've already created for you. Okay. But now for my clucking effect here with the tongue, let's see. If I turn up the delay time, and I turn, let's see. By default, I should get nothing. Okay, if I turn up the direct sound. Okay, there's just the dry tongue cluck. Okay, if I now turn up the feed forward, I'll hear a, an echo and I increase the delay time. Okay, so feed forward is going to give you one echo. Okay, one echo. If I now turn up the feedback though, okay, welcome to dub reggae. Okay, we can create all sorts of recirculating echo effects. Okay, and if you get tired of my tongue cluck, you can drag in the boom sample. It does kind of the same thing, but it's just me saying boom. Uh, I took, I had, uh, you should have something over here that says comb filter under the cheat sheets. Yeah. I dragged it in between the two plus objects and then I hit de-encapsulate. So I, I did, let's see, I'll do the inverse. What I did, what I did when I was designing these, these cheat sheets, I got the configuration I want and then I went to edit, encapsulate, that throws it in a little patcher and then you can give it a name. If you want to bring it back to the top level, you just highlight the box. So this is what you have in that comb filter box. Hit edit, de-encapsulate, and it'll bring it back to the top level. It's a way of kind of collapsing parts of the patch that you don't you want to get out of sight, out of mind. Okay. So did this help you kind of hear these delay effects and connect the delay with the comb filter? Yes. I went with demo because you guys voted for demo versus math. Okay. Friday I get my revenge and I get to give you the math. Okay. Okay. Okay, and we'll also, I'll have the Euro rack in here, we'll look at the echo, there is an echo <laughs> module on that, on that Euro rack that we can mess with, okay. Um, any questions at this point? I know it's, we're at time, so it's time to pack up, uh, unless you're so busy playing with these echoes that you just want to stay in here forever, and that's okay too. Um, 
hopefully this is starting to help you kind of wrap your head around these conceptually, what these are doing, um, and, and better understand what these plugins are doing when you're experiencing them in a DAW environment, right? What's going on beneath the surface, behind the scenes, okay? Um, let me think. I, I had another point. I can't remember. I can't remember it now. It'll come to me later. I'll have to talk about it. Don't forget the timeline on this. Don't forget to be working on project one. Don't forget to be applying some of these techniques to your project, okay? I will leave it there unless you guys have questions. No, I will see you Friday then. Less than a week before the optional draft. Thank you guys.